Welcome to the online broadcast ministry of Crossroads Church. Pastor Boone has another real-time message designed with you in mind. So grab a pen and download our online worship map and let God's word encourage your heart. Prepare to be blessed. Good morning, church. Come on, give the Lord just a simple hand clap of praise. Come on, he's worthy. Come on now, he's worthy to be great. Yes, he is. It is good to, we say this a lot in church, you know, it's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Well, I'm going to tell you, it is good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. It's good to be back with you. Hey, man. The, the, the Bible is clear. The prayers of the righteous truly avail much. And I thank you so much for your prayers. I was obedient last week, although I wanted to come back. Uh, my wife and the Lord, in that order, amen, said, no, you will be here and you will sit still and you'll get some rest. And uh, so it was well, well taken advice and it's good to be back. God is good and we are so grateful to what he's doing in our lives. Even when you have to have unannounced surgeries and things don't go like they need to go. Come on, somebody. You know God is still good. Can I get a witness? He is still good and very good. Well, we're, we're rounding the corner on this series called Don't Worry, Be Happy. And so what we have here today is a declaration and a, a, a peek into the other side of the, the praise that sometimes occurs when, we, when, we, when we're worrying. Now, everybody's, almost everybody's familiar with the circus. There are elephants and there's that incredible smell of popcorn in the air. And then there are the, the, uh, the, the trapeze family, the Gambinos. It's almost crazy how they always have an Italian name. I'm not getting that. But they, they, there's a trapeze artist that are doing the high flying. There is the ever-present uh, ringmaster. But there's one person in the circus that you could never do. Basically, you can't do without. And that would be the clowns. Now, as soon as I said that, some of y'all got afraid. You know that it's called, and I want to make sure I pronounce this correctly, the fear of clowns is called chlorophobia. And so there's some people who are really afraid of clowns. But I got to tell you this. You and I have something in common with clowns. See, some of y'all said, I'm not a clown, Pastor. Amen. I wasn't saying you are a clown. I was saying you have something in common with clowns. What would that be? Not the red nose, not the big, not the big shoes, not the little horn to go, <laughs> not that horn, right? You know what it is? It's that painted on smile. There are times when we're walking around with that smile and it's plastered on. And inside, what was it, Smokey Robinson said that, that there's tears of a clown when what? Come on, thank you, Miss Marilyn. Everybody act like they were born <laughs> saved. The tears of a clown when no one's around. We have a tendency, come on, saints of God. To wear this smile when things, I love it when people, you know, life is falling apart. And it's true. Yes, I am blessed and highly favored. But there are some times when I just cry. Anybody with me? I just, I don't know. Some, every now and again, I just need a, am I by myself? I just, I want to be realistic this morning. Sometimes I just, I'm like, Lord, I don't get this. I'm just crying. And my wife will say, what's wrong? And I'll say, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody with me this year? So then, but God still is God. He's God and very God, even through the tears. It's an incredible thing about emotions. God gave them to us, and we do our best to try to hide from them. But he gave us joy, and so we laugh in this place. But there are also times when you need a good, hearty cry. But some of the tears that we shed are because of the painted-on smile that we wear. Stand in honor of God's word. Please stand in honor of God's word. Your worship map should contain a passage of scripture from Proverbs chapter 14. If it's there, say amen. amen. All right, I'll need you on the count of three, please, ma'am, and please, sir, if you would be so gracious as to read that for me. One, two, and three. You may be seated. That's not a jump around shouting kind of passage of scripture this morning, but it's true and very true. Laughter can conceal a heavy heart. But when all that laughing ends, the grief remains. 
I want to suggest to you that the context here today is that the Proverbs writer is speaking to us, to those of us who've made a conscious choice to do our own thing. In genuine context, that's what this passage is about in Proverbs 14. Those of us who essentially try to do life without the Lord, those of us who said, I'm going to do my own thing, I got this, God, we mask our control or our semblance of control with a lot of laughter and a lot of brevity to, to, to pretend that things are going our way. But just like the clown on the outside, you may appear to be okay when you think you're running your life and you've decided what your life should be like. Uh, but when nobody's around, you know that there are tears sometimes. So here's your challenge today. I don't want you to allow your quest, watch this. I don't want you to allow your quest for happiness to rob you of joy. I don't want you to allow your quest for happiness to steal your joy. Take your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse one. Today we want to, I want to show you that God wants us to have joy beyond the superficial things that are going on around us. He wants us to have joy beyond the superficial things that are going on around us. So we're gonna look at three assumptions this morning and then three challenges or three charges that, uh, uh, three choices that you've got to make. Now we're gonna, Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse one. Now, we're going we're gonna to take a peek into the life of a guy who was a guy who truly had everything. You know someone, sometimes you hear the word, what, you, how do you give a gift to the man who has everything? Well, this is the dude who they were talking about. His name was Solomon, and he literally had everything. So, here's what we got to do in order to move beyond that fake smile, the assumption of happiness and move into genuine joy. The first thing you got to do is this. You ready? On your worship map, there should be a place for this. Watch this. God wants us to have joy that reaches beyond the superficial. So here's what we must do. I want you to dispel your assumption about happiness. We need to dispel our assumptions about what happiness truly is. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. Here's the assumption that I want you to have, that you have to get rid of. The assumption, the first assumption is this, pleasure will guarantee my happiness. We live in a world that has this belief, this assumption that if I can find pleasure, then I will be happy. Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse one says this. I said to myself, literally Solomon was saying, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with what? Come on, stay, stay awake. It's, 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 I will test you with what? Thank you. So enjoy yourself. Solomon said, I, I got it figured out. All I have to do in order to be happy is to fill my life with pleasure. And beyond it, too, was futility. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it's madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. While my mind was guiding me wisely, how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there, there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Solomon made an assumption that if he could find pleasure, he could find happiness. Many of us, too, have wrapped our happiness, our joy, around whether or not we can find pleasure in life. Now, we are granted the privilege of insight in this particular text uh, as, uh, because we, what we see here is the man who had everything uh, embarking on a personal experiment. The Bible refers to him, uh, the theologians refer, refer to him as the preacher. I find that interesting. The preacher was having a conversation with himself in his own heart. And he said uh, in this text that we're looking at this morning, he said, I've tried pleasure and I made up my mind that I would be, uh, commission laughter and entertainment as constant sidekicks. Surely they would bring me joy. Solomon said to himself, I believe Solomon's the writer of this particular book, said to himself, listen, if I can just find joy and happiness, then I'll be, I'm, I'm sorry, if I can just have pleasure and entertainment. It's funny. Uh, those of us who have kids, we, you, you're inevitable when there's, quote, nothing going on, on around the house and when there's nothing to do, they'll come out with these two words. Um, oh, that's one. <laughs> you know my kids. They're always hungry. <laughs> but the second one is what? I'm bored. There ain't nothing to do in here. As if my job is to make sure that you're entertained. Good luck with that. It's not my job. We treat the Lord as if it's his job to make us, to entertain us. And Solomon said, I, I want to entertain myself. But look at this. 
He said, I will test my, he said, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And he said, what, what was his outcome? It, this too is what? Futility, it's meaningless. He quickly discovered that entertainment led to madness and laughter accomplishes nothing. So he says, well, well, entertainment didn't do it for me. I think I'm gonna get my buzz on, amen, somebody. He said, I have tried intoxication. The text literally says, verse three, I explored with my mind how to, st I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine. There was silence in the room, amen. I explored the possibility if I can just get a little drink on. Now he didn't say, you know, Tanqueray or some of y'all like y'all know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say Johnny Walker Red. Amen. He said a little wine. If I can just, you know, get a little wine, you know, for, I'll be happy. He said if I can just keep a constant buzz, then it'll alleviate all the pain in my life. And what he found was, it's amazing how clear you are. He said when I'm drunk, he said, I, I know that two things that I found out while I was intoxicated. Joy don't last and life is short. It's an amazing thing when you ply yourself with whatever your favorite substance is, whether it may be ice cream, it may be wine, it may be food, whatever that favorite substance is of yours, when you're done consuming it, the problem that you were trying to make go away is what? Still there. He said, I, so the assumption that if I can just entertain myself, the, the assumption is that pleasure will make me happy is a false assumption. Secondly today, assumption number two. Happiness, some of us aren't keen on trying to do entertainment. We go the other way. He says happiness is found in work and success. The first, the second assumption is this. If I can just work and if I can be, become successful, then I'll be happy. That'll solve everything for me. I'm talking to the workaholics in the house. Those of us who go to, go to work and stay late at work. Those of us who bring work home. Those of us on family vacation are still doing work. I'm talking to somebody. Because what has happened, this is my opinion, I think Solomon says it happened to him, if I can stay busy, then I'll be happy. Verse number four, Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse number four. He said, I enlarge my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for, my, for, uh, for myself, from which to irrigate the forest of the growing trees. He indeed had uh, an incredible work ethic. Look at, I mean, he enlarged his territory of activity. He planted incredible hanging gardens. He mastered technical feats of engineering, given the landscape, given the arid conditions of the time. He was able to, uh, to build aqueducts and waterworks and to supply enough water to barren places to have forests. He was on point in terms of his ingenuity and his work ethic. But notice for whom he was doing all of this. I enlarged, come on, every time you see the personal pronoun, you, you see it, I enlarged whose works? Come on, thank you. I built houses for who? I planted vineyards for who? I made gardens and parks for who? Myself. I planted them in all kinds of fruit trees and I made ponds of water for who? Myself. From which to irrigate a forest of growing trees and I'll add for myself. At least that I can count and you see the personal pronoun Meyer myself five times in the text and he uses the word I six times. Don't get this twisted. When you're working day in and day out thinking you're trying to find happiness, all you're doing is trying to make fulfill self and make yourself look better than, come on, some of us have to look better to feel better. Oh, that's good. Some of you think that if you're a workaholic, it means that you're about business. Can I give you a, give you a tip? There's a guy named God. You heard of him? Arguably the most busiest person on a, a man ever known and the Bible says six days he worked And on the seventh day he did what? Now he wasn't tired. He was finished <laughs> Do you know there is a finishing point there's so much only so much you can get done in one day You have to let that thing go come on workaholics come on say let it go come on breathe in breathe out We can do it you can do it. You can leave your desk with work on your desk. Come on, somebody. 
It's called longevity. Come on, man. If they're going to fire me, at least let them have to figure out what I was doing when I left. Amen. <laughs> you got everything sewed up? Well, we can fire him a week early. We know he's... <laughs> I want them to have to work to find files at my desk. Amen, somebody. The second assumption is that work... Watch this. It's incorrect. Work never leads to lasting joy because I believe it's based on the gospel of selfishness. Third assumption this morning. So we find pleasure, Solomon said, I'm going to make myself happy with pleasure. That didn't work. Uh, Entertainment, that didn't work. Then he says, I'm going to build all these wonderful things. And after he built them, he still wasn't happy. Thirdly, the third assumption is this. The more money I make, the happier I'll be. The more money I make, the happier I will be. Look at verse 7. I brought, my, I brought male and female servants, and I've had home-born slaves. Also, I possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. This means, watch this. He says, I have actually done a better job than my father has accomplished. I'm better than my father. Come on, somebody. You know, you, you, your dad is usually your measuring stick. You want to be, come on, gentlemen in the house. I want to I do more than him. I want to be better than him. Uh, I just, I want to I stand, uh, uh, I want to stand stronger and taller because I'd like for the generation next after me to do the same thing. So I don't think he was bragging. I think he said, my dad was a great man and Lord, look at what you've done for me. I possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem, including my daddy, King David. Verse 8. Also, I collected, here it is again for myself, silver and gold and treasure of kings and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, uh, 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 many concubines. Then I've become great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem, again, including my daddy. My wisdom also stood by me, verse 10. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all of my labor. Indeed, Solomon enjoyed all the trappings of a man who worked hard, and he earned an incredible return on investment. Now, he had a lot of money. Because he had a lot of money, he was the ultimate property owner. The text tells us he had a vast amount. He had slaves. He had herds. He had flocks. He had possessions. Watch this. It's an incredible deal when you are such a lucrative man financially that generations of servants are born in your house. Do you know how much money that is? He also was a patron, a very wealthy patron of the arts. The text says he sponsored a troupe of dancers. And get this, he had his own personal choir. I think I would like one of those, amen. (laughs) Follow you around and sing, hallelujah, God is a good guy. Yes, yes, sir, that's good. Let me see what else. Can you dial up Amazing Grace while you're at lunch and your coworkers thinking, really, sir? Can you imagine being that wealthy? that you have your own personal dance troupe or your own personal choir. That's how wealthy he was. And of course, he also indulged in extensive sexual pleasures. Well, let me tell you why I think he wanted to indulge in them, amen. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's a great idea, amen, to begin with. <laughs> See, I, I, I have to get in trouble at least once before I... There ain't no way in God's green earth. <laughs> I'm going to pause, amen, for the cause. <laughs> Not going to happen, amen. He overdid it a little bit, but he was so rich he could afford, come on, you got to be rich to afford 700 wives. <laughs> I didn't get many amens on that one. <laughs> Verse 11, though. He had property. He was a patron of the arts. He owned slaves and animals. He had a serious collection of women. Verse 11. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I exerted. And behold, what does your Bible say? All was what? Meaningless and vanity. And I was chasing or I was striving after the wind. And there was no profit under the sun, a well-placed word, the word prophet. He talked about how wealthy he was, and he said, I discovered that even when I have money, there was no profit in it. 
You know how this works. There are times and times when you ask the Lord to bless you with something, but and you think that'll make you happy, but after you get it, you're still not happy. The assumption that money and more stuff will lead to happiness are, is untrue. Final assumption here for those of us, so I love this. He said, I tried to entertain myself. I tried to uh, saturate my, my body with wine. And I went on and I tried to make as much money as I could. None of that made me happy. So he said, I get it. Finally, I finally figured out what will make me happy. I'll earn a degree. I'll spend my time in academic studies. I'll even go one further. I'll go to seminary and Bible college and I'll take correspondence courses and I'll gain a degree in biblical theology. That'll make me happy. The preacher now comes to the conclusion that joy is not based on those things. So he says, maybe intellectual pursuit will do it for me. Go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 15. He says this about his intellectual pursuit. What is crooked, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 15. What is crooked cannot be straightened and what is lacking cannot be counted. When he says this phrase, that which is crooked, it's, re it's a reference to there is a problem, he says, that cannot be solved. And that which is lacking refers to I can't solve this problem because I don't have all the information. Let me get you in on a secret. You can stay at a Holiday Inn, Holiday Inn Express all you want to. You're still going to have problems in your life that you cannot understand. You can study until you're blue in the face. Come on, somebody. You can earn all the degrees that you want to, but you're going to bump into the simple problems of life and you're not going to be able to understand them. Amen. See, when you, when you place all your eggs in these wrong baskets, they come up empty. There's always going to be what he referred to as missing data, which, you can, which cannot be taken into account. And without all the data, you still won't find an answer. But still, Solomon was persistent and he tried anyway. Verse 16. I said to myself, behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has observed a wealth and a wisdom and knowledge. And I've set my mind to know wisdom and I've set my mind to know madness and folly. Interesting. He couldn't master intellectual pursuits, so he decided, I'm going to also study, since I can't master the intellectual, he says, I'm going to go ahead and study the foolishness. I'm going to study foolishness. Look at verse 17. I realize that this also is, what does it say? Striving what? Chasing what? The wind, because in much wisdom, there is also something else, much grief. Come on, somebody. Sometimes there's some stuff that you don't want to know. <laughs> when you are enlightened sometimes about the situations of lives of others, you kind of wish, God, I wish I didn't know that. Hey, I'm talking to me then. Some stuff I don't want to know. Because when you watch this, the more you know, he says, the more burdens you become. He says, there is much grief in the wisdom. Increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. So the assumption then that earning another degree will make me happy is incorrect because knowledge never leads to lasting joy. Because only God, God's ways, are, but here's why, because God's ways are impenetrable. You're never going to understand more than God does. You're never going to know as much as God does. So watch this. Can you join me here? I leave the unknown things and the tough things to God. It just took me a while to get there because I tried to fix it. Anybody like me, I'm a fixer. I got this. Four steps later, I can, no, this is not a problem. And I'm really good at telling you how to fix yours. Anybody else like me? I got solution. Come on, let's let's we got time. Anybody got a problem? I can tell you how to fix it in ten seconds. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, God is the only real problem solver in your life. Amen. Oh gosh, I wish I had a witness this morning. I've discovered that I, I've got two degrees, and I've, I'm a student of the scriptures, and I and I, and I run into stuff. Like my daughter says something, I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Let me look. Let me go downstairs in my college library and see if there's an answer for that. So rather than going to the college library, come on, somebody, I sit down or I kneel on my knees and say, God, I need an answer. Amen. He is genuinely the only person who can come on, somebody. He's the only one that can reveal the answer to your problem because he's the only one who has all the situations under. He knows every bit about this thing. Do you know you're not even fully informed about your problem sometimes? 
You don't know all the intricacies of what you're going through. So then I, rather than call my neighbor friend or call my working friend or call my college buddy or call on my wife, well, she does know a lot. She's not in the room, but I got to get that out there just in case she listens. She knows a lot. Amen. <laughs> just in case I forget to say it at 11, I'm going to rewind the 9 o'clock service and say, I, baby, I did tell you're knowledgeable. Amen. And no joke, I will turn to her in a heartbeat because I'm like, I'm clueless. What, do we, what should we do? But, when, but we both get to that place where we said, you know what, that was somebody said something like this. Is there anything too hard for who? Get this now. You are not going to entertain yourself into happiness. You're not going to come on, have enough money. to. You're not going to drink yourself into or smoke yourself into happiness. Uh, come on, somebody, or, 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 or opiate, opiate yourself. <laughs> That's not even a word. <laughs> you, there's not a pill you can pop. To make you happy, come on somebody, there's not enough cash in the bank account. I would like to try that one to have an extra or inordinate amount of cash in the bank account. But you know what? You're going to do something foolish and that won't make you happy. You can't go to school for the rest of your life. All of my theologians in the room, you're still in school. And come on somebody, anybody been in school? That, that's not happiness. That's, that's torture. Come on, anybody earn a degree? Those are the worst years of my life. Amen. I couldn't wait to graduation. You know, you start off with, a, I'm going to be an A student, and then B starts looking better. <laughs> you get to that last semester, psh, what do I need? You start, how low can I go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell the truth and shame the devil. I start, I start thinking, you know, if I get a 75 on this, I'll still be all right. So. <laughs> all of these things do not make us happy. Watch this. Matthew chapter 16. So what do we got to do? Let's flip the script a little bit. We try doing it ourselves. So here's our sec second major point. If you're really going to have lasting joy, you got to flip the script. And we must turn toward God by making a few premeditated choices. If you're going to have lasting joy in your life, you're going to have to turn your attention toward God and make a few premeditated choices. I got to hurry up. My time is running out. Choice number one. You have to, we got to choose to become more outwardly focused. Part of the difficulty for you and I, and we can't find joy, is because all we're doing is focusing on our situation and our stuff. We're doing the Solomon. I built, I built, I made, I did, I accomplished. Me, me, me. Like the two-year-old child, I always tell you that three fervent people are me, myself, and I. And when, when you're totally focused on yourself, you, you, it's a matter of time before you become disenchanted. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he or she must do what? And then do something else. Do take up what? And then once you have his cross on your back, then you do what? See, he gives us the formula in the scriptures. We just don't want to do it. Because getting drunk or having a friendship or get, earning a degree, watch this, is something that I can accomplish. But when you watch this, deny yourself, you're saying, I can't accomplish it. When you strap a cross on your back, you're saying, I can't accomplish this. When you're looking for the footprints of Jesus and you don't step anywhere that he doesn't step, you're saying to him, I can't accomplish it. Watch this. You deny yourself, which means that's not some form of self Abuse or a lack of self-esteem is just a release of control. Come on, say it with me. I can release control. Say it. I can release control to him. That's difficult in our society because everything is telling us you got to control things. Let me tell you something. You don't control anything anyway, even if you think you do. He says, deny yourself. He says, come to the conclusion. Be upfront and personal with me. You know you don't control it. Give me my props. I control it. And I give it to him every day. You know what? You got this. Amen. Then he says, exchange wills. I got to hustle. Oh, gosh. He, exchange wills. He means simply exchange your will for his will. Then he says, follow me. He says, I, I, I believe many of you know him. And I believe many of you serve him, but I want you to do more than I want you to follow him. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. I know we know him. I, I, you know, we know him in the free pardon of our sin. We know about him. And we serve, we give, we do this kind of thing. But do you follow him? Monday morning, I want you to do some, go on a personal experiment. 
Get up in the morning and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you today. Tell me where to, do, where to go. He's like, wow, who is this I'm talking to again? <laughs> this cannot be you because you never invite me into your day. So you never give me permission to lead you all day. Try it and, and, and give me a report. Look at verse 25. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will do what? You're going to find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits its soul? Or what will, it gain, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The logic here, of G Jesus' logic here um, depends entirely on the existence of an afterlife beyond the grave. When you, when you understand that there is more to this than this, then you'll understand that, w that the sorrows and the difficulties that you go through won't mean anything. They'll pale in significance to what you're headed toward. I have to remind myself to stop looking down so much and look up. I don't know if you've been in Atlanta the last couple of weeks, but the sky in my neighborhood has been great. And I was coming home from the store or something, and, some, and out of nowhere there was this beautiful patch of blueness in the sun, and I couldn't stop looking at it, and it reminded me, you know what, whatever I'm going through, I need to look up, because somewhere in that situation is a beautiful, clear patch that God's shining through. Amen. Praise belongs right there. Amen. We're so, it's so cloudy, I don't, yes, you won't see God if you've been, you got to do what? David said, I look up toward the hills because that's where my help comes from. Mm. Watch this. So the first choice is to, um, um, to choose to become more outwardly focused. The second choice, and I'm hustling, the second choice is this. You got to choose to live by the principles in order to have a true happiness, saints. You have to choose to live by the principles found in God's word. Matthew 5 verse 6 puts it this way. Blessed are those who hunger, come on, and thirst for what? For they're the only ones that are going to be what? Satisfied. Satisfaction is based, come on, is yours, but you have to be thirsty for the right thing. And what would that be? He said, I have to be hungry and I have to thirst for righteousness. What is this, what, what, what is this righteousness? Righteousness, we talked about this earlier in this series, is the state of him who is as he ought to be. Not in our own eyes, but in the condition acceptable to God. When you thirst to be right with God, come on somebody, he'll make you satisfied. When you're hungry enough to say, Lord, I want what you want from me, that's where satisfaction comes from. Amen. Psalms 119 puts it this way. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all joy, with, with, with my heart, I have sought you. Don't let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. There is an incredible connection between the word of God and your capacity to find joy and happiness in life. Many of us, come on saints, we live in a society that, that saturates us with all kinds of ideals as to how we should think and believe. There are all kinds of solutions to every kind of problem you ever want to have. And, and most of the worldly solutions, I'm not being critical, I'm just being informative, they, they are, have nothing to do with what's in God's word. If you name the name of Christ, or you are not yet a, a child of, of Christ Jesus, you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior, don't continue to think that you're going to find answers by listening to Oprah and Dr. Phil. I wish I had a witness here this morning. You spend too much of your energy watching jo Judge Judy thinking, how would she handle this? Although I'm not a fan of, the, of, of branding and making Jesus merchandise, there is some truth in the bracelet that says WWJD. You have to ask yourselves, what in the world would who do? Jesus. You want to know what would Jesus do? Check it out in the Word. Amen. Some of you have a situation that you're, that's causing you to, uh, you cannot get any rest over it. Can I, give you, can I give you some insight, a personal insight? For the fourth time this year, my doctor says, well, I see something else and I got to go in and get it. And I'm thinking, really? That, I, I will tell you, I spent an entire morning, comb I said, enough. I spent an entire mor morning combing scriptures about how God heals. Oh, somebody ought to get this. Amen. Oh, yo, that's okay, y'all don't. And, I, and I, when, I left my, when I left my office, you guys know how I am, so you know, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. This is, I was, left my office and I went up the steps. I said, he's not going to find anything this time. And I didn't share it with anybody. I said, I'm going to keep it to myself. And when I got out of surgery, he told my wife, I had the hardest time. 
Oh, that's okay. What I saw in the office, I could, I was searching. I'm like, well, I knew I saw something. Oh, you ought to get this. I eventually decided, I said, wait a minute, what am I doing? What does God say? What does God say about this? You have to saturate yourself. I'm not talking about a magic lamp where you just decide I'm going to rub God's word. And yet I'm talking about making it a part of your heart, making him a part of your soul, making it a part of your lifestyle, living, breathing, walking by the word. Not going to the word second, but going to the word first. Third choice, and I'm done here this morning. Yes, you must choose to become outwardly focused, and yes, you must choose to operate on the principles found in God's word, but more than anything else, you must choose to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. The third and final choice that leads us to the joy of the Lord is this one. It includes, I got to tell you though, this choice includes bad news and good news. Let's deal with the bad news first. Isaiah 59 puts it this way. Behold, the Lord's hand is not too short that it cannot save, nor his, is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Here it is. You've seen this passage. But your iniquities have made what? A separation between whom? See, and, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. See, Isaiah the prophet is saying here, don't get it twisted. There, God, God's arm is not too short to save. And he's not suffering from a hearing problem where he cannot hear. He said there's something blocking him. And that would be, I quote, your sins have hidden his face from you. Your iniquities have created a separation between you and your God. The Isaiah says, listen, there is something standing between you and God. Watch this. Let's turn toward the good news. Hebrews chapter 7 puts it this way. Verse 24. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able. Gosh, that's a big word. He is able also to save. How long? Those who draw near to God, watch this, through him. And since he always lives to make intercession for them. I want to close with this one thought. Uh, Watch this. The good news that God, he is able to do what? To save us. The good news that he is near. How near? As near as the mention of his name. If you're going to scale, come on somebody, a wall created by your inequities, you're going to have to have an intercessor. If you're going to make it over the boundary that's erected between your sin and your iniquities, you're going to have to have somebody on the other side. Come on, I wish I had a witness who's leaning down over the wall saying, listen, you're not going to make this on your own. Take my hand. Come on, take my hand. I need you to take my hand. And once your hands are locked in, you don't have have to do anything. Come on, but rest in him. And he says, I've been waiting for you alone. Come on. My my arm is getting tired because I'm waiting on you to take my hand. He said, I am sitting on heaven's throne next to the, at the right hand of the father, making intercession for you. But I need you to want me to intercede for you. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father is compelled to do a couple of things. He's compelled to ignore your mess. He's compelled to address your brokenness. He's compelled to forgive your sins and your iniquities. And he's also compelled because why is he compelled? Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. I want to submit to you that you don't have to be a clown walking around with a fake smile on your face, pretending that everything's all right. For for those of you who don't know Christ this morning, the Lord is begging you. I've made provision for sin. I've made provision for iniquity. I've made provision to transcend the boundary that exists between you and I. And I did so through my son. His name is Jesus Christ. And in Christ, you can have redemption and forgiveness. But here's the catch. You've got to want him. Now, for those of us who have a relationship with Christ and we're not and we're not walking in, quote, we're we're, we're depending on happiness. I want I want you to flip the script this week. I want you to begin your week and say to yourself, you know what? I'm chasing after the wrong thing. Maybe some of you are chasing after work and maybe some of you are chasing after a degree. Maybe some of you are chasing after entertainment. Maybe some of you are chasing something through ingestion substances into your body to make you feel happy. And, you know, like I know that it's not working. I need you then to turn back to Christ and go and go into your prayer closet on your knees uh, someplace private and say, Lord, I'm back. I've been away, but I'm back. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. 
I've been away for a little while, but I'm back now. I need you. And I apologize for going so far away. Tell me what I should go. Tell me where I should know. Tell me what I should do. Guide me, Lord Jesus. I'm there. Just give me what you need me to have. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to eradicate that fake smile that you walk around with, letting everybody pretending to be okay. I'm asking you if you're here this morning and you, something in your heart moved and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, maybe it wasn't a big, you know, I know depending upon where you're from, sometimes it's a big, jump, a big burst and you hit the ground and you, and you jump. And, and, but I also heard the Bible say that God moves in a still, small voice. And maybe this morning he just, it was very quiet and you heard him say, today's the day. Is there anyone here? Were you moved with a big jolt or were you, was it a still, small voice? Is anyone here who knows that they need Christ this morning? prayer that today's word encourage your heart, enrich your mind, and refresh your spirit. If Pastor Boone was a blessing to you today, please consider giving an online donation so that Crossroads can continue providing real-life answers for real-life change.